Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I love it. If we haven't had the uh, pleasure of meeting yet, my name's Mike, and I'm the discipleship director here. And we're continuing on in our sermon series, teaching through the gospel according to Mark. And as we come to our passage this morning, we actually need to remember what Mark, the, the author of this gospel account, has been trying to do all throughout his retelling of the life and ministry of Jesus. From the very beginning, he's, he hasn't been trying to tell his hearers or readers who Jesus is, but he's been trying to show them who Jesus is. The only time that he's actually told us what he thinks is right at the very beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1 when he says the beginning of the gospel or the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, God's anointed one, the Son of God. And from then on, Mark tells a series of stories about Jesus and how others responded to and reacted to him, all in the hopes that, that we would react and respond to Jesus in some way. A key theme throughout uh, Mark is one about expectations concerning who the Messiah is, God's anointed one who will bring about God's kingdom, and what kind of kingdom that will be exactly. And before we took a break from this sermon series, we saw that the religious leaders and teachers taught a very specific expectation. They believed that God's coming Messiah was to be a warrior king, very much in the image of King David, the most revered, respected, and successful king of Israel's history. To them, this Messiah would come to do violence and put to the sword all of Israel's enemies, Rome being chief among them. And in so doing, this Messiah would then go about and establish a geopolitical kingdom that would put Israel back on top in terms of political and military power like they once were and would rely on the political and religious elite of Jerusalem to administer this newly formed and everlasting kingdom of God. With the power and influence that these teachers had, these expectations became the dominant way of thinking concerning the Messiah and the kingdom for all faithful Jews, including the men and women who were called to follow Jesus and be his disciples. We see this, or have seen this, in their lines of questioning when they concern themselves on who among them was the greatest, as we see in Mark chapter 9. Or when James and John asked to sit on either side of Jesus when he brought about the kingdom back in Mark chapter 10. All of them were clearly vying for position and authority in God's coming kingdom at the expense of the others. Their expectations being rooted in the teachings of the religious leaders of the day rather than scripture. And to their shock and, and disbelief each time questions like these arose, Jesus revealed that he was and was going to be a very different kind of king, bringing about a very different kind of kingdom. The Messiah, God's true king, would not be a violent warrior who kills his enemies. Rather, he would lay down his own life for his enemies. And the kingdom he was bringing was not a geopolitical one, taking its turn on the top of worldly power and influence. Rather, it would be a kingdom rooted in the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, a kingdom that lifted up and favored the weak and powerless rather than the strong and influential, a kingdom whose citizens don't fight their enemies but pray for them and actually seek their well-being, a kingdom that exudes the sacrificial love of its king. And the reality of, of what kind of king Jesus was and what kind of kingdom he was actually bringing inevitably led to the critique of the dominantly held expectations taught by the religious leaders. And at their own instigation, Jesus debated with them all throughout his ministry as he showed them and all around the goodness and power of his ways against the misled and powerlessness of their ways. 
And this critique culminates when Jesus enters Jerusalem. He goes straight to the temple, overturning the tables of those profiting from doing business there and famously crying out that they have made what was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations into a den of robbers. The man who was supposed to be their long-awaited Messiah wasn't pitting himself against their Roman oppressors, but rather against them, the very people who thought they were walking in the ways of God. This critique that Jesus levels against the religious leaders of his own nation, coupled with their own power and influence, led them to believe that if Jesus wasn't for them, that he must be against them, and thus needed to be dealt with. This kickstarts what would be the final week of Jesus' life as the religious leaders commit to and begin planning for his death. This is the plan that is finally coming to fruition as we come to our passage this morning. So in your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 14, and we'll read verses 43 to 52. Uh, If you don't have your Bibles with you, the verses will be up on the screen. But Jesus has just finished uh, his agonizing time in prayer to his father, speaking with him about his own foreseen death, and he continues, or sorry, he comes to his disciples and tells them that his betrayer has come. And Mark continues in verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. So what we see here is the incredibly chaotic moment when two very different kingdoms collide with one another. The religious leaders have been waiting for the opportune time to strike out at Jesus. And this was arranged for them by Judas, a man who was counted as one of the 12 closest followers of Jesus, a man who has presumably spent close to the last three years traveling with, learning from, and working with Jesus. Now, we can speculate as to why Judas did what he did. Perhaps he had become impatient with Jesus, waiting for him to become and do who Judas and most of the Jews of the day expected the Messiah to do. That if Jesus was cornered, perhaps he would finally lash out, rise up, and fight against his enemies. Or perhaps Judas was the first of the disciples to come to terms with the reality that Jesus was simply not going to be the Messiah everyone expected him to be. And the cynical side of Judas, hardened by the unjust realities and violent power of the world, took over. That love for your enemies won't stop them if they have simply decided to kill you. And in the hopes of cutting his losses and being on the right side of history, he decided to sell out his former teacher and friend in order to ingratiate himself to those seemingly in charge and more powerful than Jesus. Whatever his motive, what we see here is a man responding in a way that is dictated by his own expectations of who he thinks Jesus should be. Mark once again is showing us a story of how people responded to Jesus, and that even at the end of his life, people were compelled to respond one way or another to this unexpected Messiah. The severity and scandal of Judas's betrayal often takes the spotlight when reading the narratives of Jesus' arrest, at least for me it does. 
However, like we've seen all throughout Mark's account, Judas is not the only one of the disciples that's operating from misunderstood expectations of what the Messiah and God's kingdom is supposed to look like. After Judas greets and kisses Jesus, uh, something that was actually a common sign of respect from a disciple to his rabbi, but this time it was the sign that was to reveal amidst the darkness who this small army was meant to arrest, Mark says, and they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. This unnamed disciple responds with violence, attempting to meet force with force, thinking that he was coming to the aid of his king. Mark doesn't reveal which of the disciples this is. However, from John's gospel account, we know this man to be Peter, the man who pledged his allegiance to Jesus only moments before arriving to the garden, adding that he would die with him if he had to. Peter sees this as his heroic last stand moment, and I actually get this. I don't know if it's just me or maybe a guy thing, but I, I would not be, it's kind of like back when it's like, how, many, how often do you think of Rome you know, in, your, in your week, right? But I, I actually can't count the times, this is a little embarrassing, that I've daydreamed a moment, probably while watching The Lord of the Rings or Saving Private Ryan, of being beside my friends, facing an insurmountable enemy, and going out with, in a blaze of glory. And I don't know if this feeling comes from our own fallenness and living in a broken, violent world where might often makes right, or if there is a God-ordained way to use this energy and attitude. But what I do know is that in this moment, Peter responded in a way that looked more like our broken world than the world Jesus is ushering in and acted contrary to his call to love your enemies and to seek their well-being. We know this because in each of the other gospel accounts, Jesus actually rebukes Peter, telling him to stop and to put away his sword. Luke's account even adds that Jesus goes to the servant whose ear has been struck off and heals him. Jesus responds with love and healing rather than hate and violence, remaining consistent to the kind of king the Messiah was to be that he has been portraying for his whole life. And this actually brings us to the man and moment that Mark is trying to direct our gaze to, Jesus himself. He's shown us how the religious leaders have responded by sending people to capture Jesus, ushering him closer to his death. And he's shown us how two of his closest disciples chose to respond in betrayal and violence. But how does Jesus respond to this moment? Like the man we know who walked on water or was found peacefully sleeping during a storm before quieting it with a word, here Jesus is amidst this chaotic, highly charged situation, responding not with violence of his own, but rather in calm and with words, driving at the injustice of the moment. Mark recounts, and Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus confronts his captors by asking them a question. Not for his own sake, but to make clear the injustice that's being done. Jesus has been teaching all week in Jerusalem. He hasn't been hiding evading his captors like a thief would. He's been roaming the city and publicly teaching at the temple. His question could rather be stated, if I have truly done wrong, why are you arresting me in the middle of the night in secret and not in front of everyone? And the answer is because Jesus has done nothing wrong. The common physiological response to stress or danger is to fight or flee. And in light of this injustice, Jesus would be right to do, to do either. To fight back against those abusing their power 
or to run away and find safety amongst the crowds of people who hailed him as the son of David a week prior when he first came to the city, bringing to light the corruption of these religious leaders. However, he doesn't do either of these things. Instead, he surrenders himself willingly stepping into the unjust suffering they had planned for him. And at his surrender, all hope is seemingly dashed. The disciples were prepared to fight if Jesus fought and were prepared to flee if Jesus ran, but they weren't willing to surrender. And so they abandoned the man that they had placed all of their hopes in. Judging a political or religious movement by the world's standards, this looks like a monumental failure of a movement. And on the surface, its downfall looks like it's come by the hands of others. That it was the plans and the decisions of the corrupt leaders and the jaded disciple that has succeeded in capturing Jesus and bringing about the suffering and death of a would-be Messiah. But in a single sentence, Let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus makes clear that what's happening here at his arrest and what's about to happen at his execution is not because of the success of their plans, but God's. What plan could Jesus possibly be talking about and where is it in scripture? Like most things in the Bible, we can gain insight and understanding by going back to the very beginning to a scene in the story that took place in another garden. After God creates a good world, teeming with life and potential, God creates humanity, Adam and Eve, and establishes them in the Garden of Eden, a place made unique through God's manifest presence as he regularly walked and communed with the people he made in his image. People who are actually destined to mature more into his image, expanding the glory and goodness of the garden to the whole world, stewarding and ruling it like God would. However, in Genesis chapter 3, we're introduced to a snake, a twisted creature bent on distorting and destroying God's image and his good world. And this evil successfully tempts Adam and Eve to question God's goodness, to take matters into their own hands and to trust their own wisdom, bitterly rejecting God's. This moment shatters all of the good that God had created and begins the spiral to even greater chaos, a chaos that we still experience today. In any other story, all hope would have been lost but not this story. Amidst the despair of this moment, when God comes to them, confronting them like a father who confronts his children, telling them the natural consequences of their actions and the brokenness of the world moving forward, he offers them hope. that things will not always be this way. And when condemning the snake, God says in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here, God proclaims a promise that there will come a day when one of Eve's children, a son of man, will do battle with and defeat the snake that's at the root of all evil, crushing its head. However, in so doing, he will not come out unscathed. He too will suffer and experience the venomous bite of the snake. From this moment onward, the Hebrew scriptures, our our Old Testament, whispers of this promised king, this wounded victor who will suffer at the hands of evil but will eradicate it at its source. The prophet Isaiah, however, turns this whisper into a shout, bringing further clarity to God's promise and plan to redeem and restore his creation. Isaiah spoke to a rebellious Israel brought to exile in Babylon, an image very similar to the image we see with Adam and Eve. He spoke of Israel's brokenness, 
an inability to walk by God's wisdom, but that the exile they were experiencing because of that was not the end. God would rescue his people. Not only that, but like the redemption and restoration of Israel, God would do the same for the whole world, bringing redemption to all. But how would he do this? Who would pay this ransom price? And we see that it's God's suffering servant revealed in Isaiah 52 and 53. Isaiah writes of God saying, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was actually on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was, like, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. This is the plan Scripture puts forward, the plan that was embedded in the heart of Jesus when he surrenders to the mob, declaring that Scripture must be fulfilled. As the Messiah, God's promised king, he would battle not with Roman legions or the Jewish elite, but with the serpent of the garden, the evil at the root of our brokenness. And he knew this battle would require him to suffer. The snake would sink its fangs into his heel. He willingly surrendered to suffering because he knew that this was the plan. But he also knew that it wasn't the end. As we saw outlined in Isaiah, in trusting God, God would lead him through suffering and death into life, not only for himself, but for the many. So this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane reveals Jesus putting his trust in God, even when it meant being led to his suffering and death. So how is Mark hoping that his hearers and readers will respond to this? Yes, it's to see and know the great lengths of love and sacrifice that our Heavenly Father went to in order to rescue his children. But even more practically, we are to see Jesus as an example to emulate when we experience our own suffering. Surprise, it's all about suffering. Happy Sunday, everybody. <laughs> it's to encourage. This is a to encourage, okay, as we go forward from here. One of the reasons Mark wrote his gospel account when he did was because of the rising tensions and persecutions of Christians in the Roman Empire. In the year 64 CE, a great fire actually swept through Rome, devouring much of the city. And historians have revealed that the likely culprit was the mad emperor Nero himself who sought to rebuild the city how he saw fit. However, when Nero couldn't avert the suspicions of the Roman people that he was the cause of their suffering, he pinned the blame on Christians. 
which led to mass persecution, arrests, and torturous executions of those who followed Jesus, people who were already treated with contempt for their faith. Mark was writing about the suffering servant king to a suffering church in the hopes that they would look to Jesus as their example and not the disciples who betrayed or abandoned him. I will be 100% honest, I don't like suffering. I actively avoid it. I assume most of you do too. And yet, we live in a world where suffering is the norm, not the exception. In our relative comfort here in North America, and perhaps due to the temptation to believe in a gospel that focuses more on prosperity than on Christ, it might be easier to ignore the realities of suffering. But following Jesus, the true king of this world, does not mean we will not suffer. In fact, Jesus is quite clear that we will. In John 15, 20, Jesus says, Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Whenever I've read these verses, I always thought that the only suffering that's being talked about here is persecution for our faith. And in the first one, he's certainly talking about persecution for our faith. But the Greek word translated as trouble in this second verse means pressure. And it speaks of a reality that we see in the world and in Scripture, that suffering includes persecution, yes, but it's also broader. Suffering could be seen as a spectrum. On the one side, we have extraordinary suffering. People in our world, ourselves included, face all kinds of extraordinary moments of suffering when something so terrible and life-altering happens that uh, the trajectory of our lives changes in an instant. This includes moments of persecution for faith, the very kind of suffering Mark's initial audience was experiencing themselves. But it's also things like living through war or a natural disaster receiving a terrible diagnosis or experiencing relational breakdown due to death or divorce, to name some of the worst. Many of you in this room have gone through or are going through this very kind of suffering. And not to be the supreme downer this Sunday morning, but many of us will experience this kind of suffering if we haven't. Moments like these are unbelievably painful, disorienting, and confusing. And it's in moments like these that people are faced with the choice of either running toward God or away from Him. Extraordinary suffering is easy to see and it's easy to label, but on the other side of the spectrum is a category often forgot about, and we could call it ordinary suffering. We all experience day in and day out the sufferings of ordinary life, the pressures of work, Deadlines, relationships, marriage, kids, money, exams. The monotony and low-grade stress of everyday life compounds and subtly takes its toll, slowly wearing us down and producing in us hairline fractures just waiting to fully break. This slow wearing down, like extraordinary suffering, can point us toward or away from God, either slowly building up callous around our hearts or presenting opportunities to pursue the way of Jesus in the normal, uninteresting, and often boring moments of everyday life. We all find ourselves on this spectrum. We all, to one degree or another, suffer. And our faith in Jesus what he's accomplished and what he's ushering in does not prevent us from experiencing this harsh reality of life. But like the people Mark puts on display in our passage this morning, we too have to choose how we will respond to suffering. We can let it harden our hearts, turning us bitter. We can fearfully respond with, with violence. 
Or we can lay down our lives and put our trust in God despite our circumstances to pursue, like Jesus, loving God with everything we have and our neighbors like ourselves, seeking to build God's true kingdom even when it just doesn't make sense. When we pursue the way of Jesus, our suffering might not go away, but it can be redeemed for our ultimate good. This is the paradox of suffering, that in God's hands, it can actually have a role to play in our lives. To be clear, though, suffering is not God's will. God does not desire that you and I suffer. In fact, God's will is to do away with suffering, like we see in the Gospels with Jesus healing the hurt and the sick, or like we see in Revelation chapter 21, when God's kingdom finally comes in full, it says he will wipe away every tear. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Suffering will be no more. But this guarantee is not yet. What is guaranteed now is that God will be with us and will redeem our suffering like the very sufferings of Christ, using what the enemy from the Garden of Eden planned for bad, and through his grace and power, if we let him, will bend our suffering so that good will ultimately happen. Maybe not now, maybe not even in our lifetime, depending on what we're going through, but God will have the final say, not suffering. In our culture, we often want to ignore, escape, or explain away suffering. However, the reality of the role that it can play was something the apostles actively taught the early church. Christian poet Michael Card comments that Paul saw suffering as a present reality more than a problem to be solved. Like Jesus, he entered redemptively into the sufferings of the believers he encouraged. And so he can tell followers of Jesus then and now in Romans chapter 5 that suffering can actually produce endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Paul here doesn't promise an end to suffering but rather transformation through redeemed suffering. There's a form of, of Japanese art that actually perfectly embodies what God can do with the suffering we experience in our lives. Kintsugi is an art form that takes the broken pieces of everyday pottery and puts them back together using gold and lacquer to fuse the pieces back together. Taking what once was ordinary and broken, mending and renewing it into something of even greater beauty and value. Like these works of art, we, through suffering, can experience transformation into new creations. And by God's love, presence, and Holy Spirit, we'll become people with the very character of Christ and have the same hope that God will lead us through suffering like he did with Jesus. Despite this hope, I'll be honest, my first reaction to suffering isn't to think of it as an opportunity for character building. It's actually to ask why. Why, God, am I going through this? Why, God, are you allowing this to happen? Why do we suffer? But what I often forget, what I always forget, actually, is that the why of suffering, to a degree, has been established already back in Genesis chapter 3. Humanity's choice has led to a broken, unfair, and randomly chaotic world a world that's also full of people, of of hurt people, who perpetuate the cycle of hurting people. Thankfully, God is big enough and loving enough to accept us asking why. But through Mark's gospel, we see the example of Jesus leading us to ask a different question. How? How do we suffer? clear that one piece of the response to that question is to be open and honest in prayer. As we learned last week, Jesus wasn't afraid to bear it all before God. 
Despite knowing the rescue plan outlined, outlined in Scripture, Jesus still asked God if there was another way so that he wouldn't have to go through the suffering that was before him. However, he continued by placing his trust ultimately in God and his wisdom when he praised the incredibly difficult words of yet not what I will, but what you will. And it's easy to be tempted to think, yeah, but that was Jesus, God in the flesh. Of course he could pray and trust that way. However, we see throughout Scripture people responding in a similar way, none more so than Job. And depending who you are, he's a man who experienced more suffering in a moment than you'll experience in a lifetime, or he's a man who suffered in very similar ways to you. After losing his financial stability, his children, his health, and being surrounded by incredibly unloving and unhelpful friends, Job finally explodes, questioning God's goodness and wisdom and demands to know why. He finally comes to God in brutal honesty. And to this, God doesn't rebuke Job. He actually shows up. Now, God never actually answers Job's question of why, an answer that would have never actually given Job peace or satisfaction. Instead, he takes Job on a tour of the universe and asks him a series of questions that actually results in Job realizing how limited his own sight and wisdom are when compared to the infinite God and creator of the universe. Job is lovingly brought to a place where he chooses to trust and find his peace in God despite all of the bad he's experiencing. A response that was lived out by Jesus here in the garden. Not my will, but your will. When we come face to face with suffering, ordinary or extraordinary, we can be like Judas and let the fractures and breaks we experience in life jade us make us cynical and lead us to unbelief. We can be like Peter and fight force with force and just perpetuate the cycle of suffering onto others. Or we can be like Jesus and come to God in honesty and then move towards trust that God is faithful and will redeem the bad in our lives for the ultimate good of being shaped more into the image of Jesus an image of a love and trust-filled suffering servant. There's no real, uh, there's no real good way I can end uh, a sermon on suffering. But what I do know is that Jesus knows our suffering. He willingly stepped into it himself to show us how to go through it with love, humility, and trust. So perhaps the best way to conclude this time is to simply create space and to enter into God's presence and allow him to enter into our suffering. Take time. Take some time and reflect on where you find yourself on the spectrum of suffering. We're all there. What's shaking the very foundation of your life? Or what's slowly wearing you down? And bring it before God in honesty. But instead of asking why, I encourage you to look to Jesus as the example and dare to ask a different question. How can I suffer in this moment that reflects the loving way of Jesus? Father, we we come to you in our own suffering and we can say thank you and praise you that from the very beginning you made a way to bring sin and suffering to an end. thank you that you chose to step into our suffering by walking toward and enduring the cross. Holy Spirit, shape us into people who look like Jesus. People who trust God and extend grace and love even in the midst of suffering. We can't do that on our own. Holy Spirit, we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me, church. In ancient-
ancient times, the one who offered a blessing raised their hands and those wanting to receive a blessing did likewise. So Soul Sanctuary, a, a blessing about suffering from priest and poet John O'Donohue. May you know tender shelter and healing blessing when you are called to stand in the place of pain. May the places of darkness within you be surprised by light. May you be able to see the fruits of suffering. And though the darkness is now deep, you will soon see approaching light. May this give you confidence and trust, and may the grace of transfiguration heal your wounds. Be blessed, and we'll see you next week.